Um, it's yours, Charlie. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Maggie Johnson. Uh, please tell us about your living history. Okay, thank you. So thank thanks to Sri and and for the organizers for this for this invitation to present um, in this in this series. I think it's it's an inspiring series and it's really an inspired series. It's a, a really original great idea. Um, so I actually want to start with with where I am now. So I'm a I'm a professor at Johns Hopkins um, in the biophysics department. And um, you know, I really love my job as a professor, as a scientist, and as an academic. I really feel like we have the opportunity to to push back the frontiers of science and to um, expand our human knowledge. And you know, I I think that the research we're able to do it has significance. It's not what I would call translational, but um, it does have connections to human health and disease, and that's and that's something that that is important to me. And but it's not what I aspired to be when I was a kid. If you would have asked me, I would never would have said, "Oh, I, I'm going to be a scientist." Um, and so I was I was thinking about that, and I um, oops, let's see if we can go to the next. Okay, so I, I asked my my own kids. Let me let me mute this. Um, we don't need to hear them singing. What do you guys want to be when you grow up? And so my daughter actually says scientist now. She's eight, so this is exciting. She said, although she says with test tubes, so neither me nor her dad. Um, do anything with test tubes or anything that is wet at all. Um, and then I asked my son and, and he said, I'm going to be an artist. He said, remember, I told you how much I love art. And I said, well, that's great because I want you to do something that you love. And so we'll see in 20 years if, they, if they're like me, they will not be doing what they say they're going to do, but they would still have the same um, you know, set of interests that hopefully is going to expand just like mine did. So um, and, you know, one of the reasons I started off with how much I like my job is because I think my parents really love their job. My mom taught piano. She still teaches piano. She taught all of us how to play the piano. My dad is retired, but he was a kidney doctor and he would come home from work and say, I'm back from a day of saving lives. And so, um, you know, he really... Um, it really seemed like a rewarding job. And he talked about the intellectual stimulation. He actually had a research lab as well that never seemed as exciting as his life-saving um, role as a doctor. And so sort of coincidentally, um, three of my siblings are also medical doctors. Um, and then my twin sister is a social worker. And then I became um, an academic. And so there's a, there's a bit of a theme of, of human health throughout the family. Um, and so what did, what did I want to be? So my absolute favorite subject was math, even and I still remember quite vividly in first grade, I loved the basic facts and being timed and having to solve them as fast as possible. And it has continued to be my favorite subject, but I also loved animals. And so I thought, well, we, you know, people ask, what are you going to be? I'm going to be a veterinarian. Um, and, you know, somehow I'll still use math, right? It's everywhere. Um, and so then I continued, I had these same interests. Uh, this is not a picture of me in high school, but I, I like that I did a science project on cells. They're so fascinating cells. And so I, I appreciated that early on. Biology's living things are so interesting. I didn't, I didn't care as much for physics. And this is in part, you know, the way that you learn physics in high school, you don't know calculus and, and you're learning about balls rolling down planes, right? That's not, it's not as interesting as a, as, a, as an animal. And it just felt like it was full of approximation. Like you had to pretend like air didn't exist and friction didn't exist. And then in math, you solve these things exactly, perfectly, beautifully. So it really felt like, like, what do these guys think they're doing? Just, you know, this, and it really wasn't until college, in fact, that, um, I took physics in college and I appreciated, oh, actually, this might be an extremely powerful and um, way to actually explain the way that the world works. So um doesn't always happen right away. And um, I still, I went to college at the same place as the, the Ghostbusters, um, scientists of the paranormal. Um, although I, I, I went to New York City, I majored in applied math. And um, because I still love math and I'm very practical. And um, I still wanted to be a veterinarian, I thought, but there were two things that happened during my sophomore year. One, I took a pre-professional class in, and it was in biomedical engineering. And they brought in these professionals, health professionals, um, doctors and scientists, and they talked about engineering problems that needed to be solved. And they were all new problems. They needed new solutions. They were things that people hadn't figured out before. Um, and so it really felt like you had to solve these problems to help you know, with this 
with this enterprise of human health. And that struck me as really exciting and a new way to be quantitative in, um, you know, sort of the realm of health sciences and living systems. And the other thing that happened was September 11th. And I think these singular events, they often force you to reflect, you know, what's my place in the world, right? I'm a student now, I'm going to, I'm going to finish college, I'm going to graduate, do I really want to be a veterinarian? And take all those pre-med classes. And I thought, no, I don't want to do that. And I've seen this opportunity about how I can work on problems that are new and um, that require a really quantitative skill set. And so then I, I started doing research that very semester. I, found, I talked to the TA. He said, here's people you can do research with. And I've been doing research ever since. And so I went to grad school. That was when I decided basically to be a scientist. I thought I would like to do neuroscience because it's fascinating. And um, the, the problem was all the faculty who worked in neuroscience said you have to do experiments as well. And I'd done enough experiments as an undergrad to decide that it's not it's not my favorite way. It's it's very important. But when you solve problems in experiments, this it's they're complicated. And so it's hard to control everything. So you have to do things over and over again without even making changes. So I didn't like that. Um, and so I, I, instead of doing that, I did what is really physical chemistry. And so this is a sort of a bizarre transition, but I left dynamical systems and I, I knew almost nothing about these molecular systems, about statistical mechanics and many body systems. So um, I thought this would provide a great foundation for studying living systems. Also water, even super cooled water is important um, for living systems. And so, I, and I really think it has, it did provide an, an excellent foundation for my subsequent work, which has been much more um, at the cell scale. And that's, and that's where I've gone to since then. And so now my research is, it combines mathematical modeling with applications in living systems. So we study self-assembly, and how it can be controlled so that um, you you actually assemble these things at the proper place and at the proper time that they're needed for physiologic function, whether in endocytosis, it's bringing something into the cell or virus assembly, whether it's trying to escape from the cell. And we can use theory and models and computer simulations. Um, and, I, and I find it you know, incredibly rewarding. Um, and so I want to say, you know, summarize some of the things I have learned or relearned throughout my trajectory um, sort of, um, you know, when I was a, you know, of course we're all unique, right? When I was in grad school, I, I read quite a few scientific biographies, you know, what, what, what are other people, other scientists like, and, you know, not everyone's story really has to resonate. So there's, you know, these stereotypes, people like they, they worked in, they liked radios or chemistry sets, or they took things apart and put them back together, or they, they were interested in computers and how they work. And I was just not interested in any of this stuff. It was really, interested in like in my dog you know he was he was fascinating and he has a nose but his nose is also very different from my nose and so I was that's what I found um stimulating um and then again at a conference in grad school one of the senior faculty said you know science is a human it's a human endeavor so it's imperfect um there's bias but it's also a it's a community um that, that you're a part of. And even if you, if you really like to work independently, right, without, without actually connecting to a community and the work of others, um, you know, there's no way for your ideas to spread between people and actually, you know, eventually make an impact. And so I've, I started going to APS meetings and I keep going because I enjoy it so much. I've been going to biophysical society since grad school. I, I stopped going to ACS as in grad school, but then I went again this year and I saw so many old friends. I saw my PhD advisor. Um, so it's it's there's old friends, there's new friends, there's new connections, and I found these communities to be a great source of friendship and stimulation. Um, of course, there there are many more things that you don't know that you do. So you're and you know no matter how much time you think you have, you're going to sort of retain this ignorance on many things. So even someone else is an expert, and I have this silly Google thing because actually as a grad student, I asked one of the other students. You know, what's a methyl group? And he was sort of like, do you really not know that? I said, you know, well, right, I could ask you or I could ask Google and probably I should have known it, but you know, what exactly is it? You know, we have to learn these things um, some way or another. And um, so again, I'll, I'll end on this note that, you know, we all started off as kids at some point and you, you know, if you, if you can acknowledge what you don't know, 
it's really the fastest way to learn. And I, I like to ask my kids math problems at dinners to really emphasize the the importance and the wonderfulness of math. And, and I asked my son and he sort of paused and my daughter said, oh, that's so easy. And you know, I said, well, you learned this, um, you know, two years ago, it was a mystery to you too, right? You, you, you learn these things and then they become easy, but first they start off all as mysteries. So you have to acknowledge that you don't know and you have to keep asking um, these questions and you know, eventually you start asking questions and, you know, like my daughter says, what are dreams and why do we dream and and how does that work? And I say, I don't know. And I'm not sure anybody knows. And, and that, and that opens up um, opportunities for you to really, you know, contribute. Maybe, maybe one day she'll work on that kind of a problem and, and contribute to our human knowledge. Um, and um, so that's, that's where I, where I see the, really the rewards of this, of this, um, of working in science. And thank you, that's it. Thank you for a fantastic talk, Maggie. And uh, I'm applauding on behalf of the audience. Um, we'll start with uh, a question from, from the audience. Um, do you ask your children math problems as a treat or as a punishment? Um, yeah, so it's not as a punishment. Punishment. They they don't have to answer the math questions, and um, but they and actually sometimes my daughter says no, now is not the time. But my son actually gets excited, and in fact, it it's it's a little bit manipulative because then he will start answering them, and then, and then she says, "Ask me, ask me." So um, you know, they don't have to do it. They um, they do seem to enjoy it. It's a good question. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um. I guess um, so. We have one other question here. You um, you mentioned you know that not every story has to, to resonate. And thinking about your story coming from a different, what wanting to do something different and having this experience where after some reflection you you decided to become you know a scientist. Um, when you're working with uh, younger people, um, how do you encourage them to embrace those types of experiences and take that time for the, the self-reflection to uh, to perhaps decide, no, this is not what I want to be doing. Yeah, I I mean, yeah, that's a good question. I I I um I guess I I ask students to to think about, you know, really what what is how one thing is what is what is your favorite and where do you see yourself in five years if if sort of everything works out according to plan. Um, one of one of the strange things about our students sometimes is that they all want to graduate early, and I and I wonder what well, what's the rush? What do you what do you, you do? You already know what you're gonna do, and they say, "Well, I'll take a year off." But I mean, why not just finish finish college and and explore and and um, you know you can you can change your mind. Actually, I you know I I went I did this. PhD in sort of physical chemistry and now I don't really work at that scale anymore so you can you can move and change and and come back around to where you started if 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 you if you take the time to explore so great thank you uh, thank you again